This is Kan Zenshu, the podcast episode 449 for the week of July 8th, 2018. <laughs> What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Cons and Shoe, the podcast, an extension of the all-encompassing Dragon Ball fan site. Cons and Shoe. We cover anything and everything broccoli, in hopes of enlightening and a little bit of entertaining. I don't know. I'm kind of a carrot fan myself. You carrot fan? <laughs> yep. Uh, broccoli's versus carrots. Is that, wait, is that you can't pluralize that? Um. Hello, uh, excuse me, sir, I don't think we've spoken in six months. Well, not on on this waveform technology, we have not. We may have new people that don't even know who you are. Heath Hugio, uh, if anyone can even remotely be considered 25% my boss, uh, it's you. It is I. I am back. I am still alive somehow. I've been insanely busy, but uh, things are going well, I would say. That's good. Yeah. Uh, you are here to chat with me. My name is Mike uh, Vegito EX. So we've got two Geo and Vegito EX. We are two fourths of the content you. Um, Heath, we're gonna talk about Broly tonight, huh? We are. You're you're Team Broccoli. I'm Team Carrot. And all right, we're, we're gonna see see what happens by the end. You know, there's gonna be crying. Might be a little bit of stabbing. Maybe. Oh, so. Initially, we uh, we were going to do the the actual plan was to do that mid year predictions check in, and uh, I actually wanted you Heath to be on that show because I had yeah. the other two guys at, at the beginning of the year I like to kind of trade spots and uh, tear apart everyone else's predictions. Uh, that all changed the other day when we got new information about this year's upcoming Dragon Ball Super theatrical film, Dragon Ball Super theatrical film Broly. That's it. We can all go home now. Yep. That, that's everything you need to know. <laughs> uh, I'm glad we've taken a little uh, extra time here. We, we gave it a day. We sat on things for a little bit. We have some things to say. Maybe we don't have things to say. Uh, you and I have not chatted about what we're bringing to the table on this here episode, but uh, our, our topic is our news this week. We're doing one of those episodes where it's all one in the same. We're going to do a comes and shoe style. We're going to break down what that news actually is, what the announcements were, uh, maybe the significance of some of those announcements within the larger announcement. And then we're going to give you our thoughts uh, as as best we can. Maybe semi-coherently? Yeah, we'll see uh, by the time we get to the end of this. Yeah, I, I have whiskey. Do you want some? Uh, I would love some. I, I have a glass of wine. I, I'm, I'm fancy this evening. Ooh, there we go. All right, so uh, that's what's on tap this episode. We're, we're going to chat back and forth all about the broccolis, uh, and uh, we'll see you on the flip side, and we'll see if we want to continue running Consensu into 2019. That is what's on tap. Let's get on into it right now. So, Heath, this Monday, July 9th, uh, we received a wealth of new information about the upcoming Dragon Ball Super theatrical film. Uh, We knew it was going to be branded as Dragon Ball Super. We knew we were going to get new character designs by a one Mr. Shintani. Uh, Much looser style. They're very much looking forward to it on the production side of things. Uh, We knew we were going to have uh, original characters and original story and uh, script from original author Akira Toriyama himself. Uh, It it sounded like they were heading towards a a brave new realm of theatrical films for the Dragon Ball franchise. And then they dropped all this on us, and it seemed like it flipped everything on its head. Let's just talk about the the actual news here. So, the greatest enemy, the A person, Saiyan. Broly, uh, the name of the film appears to simply be Dragon Ball Super Broly. Let's talk about some of the other announcements as well. <laughs> <laughs> we get a bunch of voice announcements, and that's always great to have. Uh, I think I'm glad they announced this right as they announced the the name of the film and, and showed us the character. Bin Shimada is coming back, uh, presumably as Broly. He has played Broly since, what, 1993? Uh, when yep. DBZ Movie 8 first came out, he has always been Broly. He's still screaming Kakaroto to this very day. Uh, it seems like every other month in video game content. Um, that, that seems very natural. Uh, even when characters have changed and evolved over the years, for the most part, they, uh, other than some of the recastings we got in Dragon Ball Kai, uh, everyone has kept their character for the most part. So uh, Shimada seems like he's coming back as Broly. Uh, we have a new voice for 
presumably, again, we say because uh, they're just listing the the names of the actors. They're not attributed to uh, characters or roles here. Uh, we have Katsuhisa Hoki, who will likely be playing Broly's father, Paragus. And we say that because he has taken over the role as Paragus in video game content over the last couple of years uh, because the uh, previous voice actor, EMS Kayumi, passed away uh, in, in 2014. Uh, and speaking of tragic passing aways, uh, the new Dragon Ball Super film seems like it will be the theatrical kind of long form debut for Aya Hisakawa as Bulama. Um, we, we have had some content with her um, in what commercial was that? Uh, it feels like a, a couple of months ago. At oh, this point. it was the cleaning commercial. Ah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. As we recently had a, another <laughs> new commercial lately all about Vegeta. Uh, but uh, a prior commercial was technically Hisakawa's uh, debut as Bulama. Uh, seems like she'll be playing uh, the role here as well. Other voices we got listed, they, they make sense. Koichi Yamadera, probably coming back as Beerus. Masakazu Morita, probably coming back as Whis. I don't anticipate Tarbol being in this film. Uh, Toshio Furukawa, obviously, will be playing Piccolo. And Takashi Kusao playing trunks uh we're going to assume this is going to be the younger trunks in this film although we have absolutely no idea for all we know future trunks is going to come back uh we don't have any information about that right now just that kusa or they'll both be in it or <laughs> that's very true very true uh we don't know we just know that kusa will be in it uh he was actually listed in resurrection f though wasn't he yes just for the the slicing flashback scene. Uh -huh. So for, for all we know, we're going to get something like that in this film. So, uh, you know, use Resurrection F as your baseline for just because you get someone listed this soon. Um, don't extrapolate that out into some kind of larger role in the film. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just like uh, Masako Nozawa is listed as Son Goku. But so far, there's been no indication whether Gohan or Goten will appear but presumably <laughs> if uh if trunks is going to be in you would assume goten is if it's not future trunks i guess right. we can hold out hope and they'll still be children that are teenagers yes. we'll talk hold on we'll talk about character <laughs> designs a little later <laughs> um i mean other before we get into some meat and potatoes here they're uh, obviously doing a uh, pre-purchase campaign for the tickets it doesn't really apply to anyone over here in the states unless i don't know i really some... want something that's going to change colors well, no. Heath, have I got news for you. What? Is it temperature related? It is temperature related. You you could be the proud owner of a Goku. I think it's interesting. He's listed as Goku and not Son Goku right here on this artwork. I think um, that that's the, um, the grand piece of information to take out of this. Uh, Goku or Vegeta, you get a choice. You can't have both. Uh, that change color from, it's a keychain, I think it is. That changed mm -hmm. from Super Saiyan to Super Saiyan Blue. Um, Ooh. If you purchase tickets ahead and of And they're in their little Arctic attire. Yes, yes, new character yep. designs, new clothes for the new film. Uh, and those go on sale July 20th, so that's coming up soon. So he's on the official website and sent out to all the press folks uh, alongside these new announcements. Uh, we have new poster art uh, alongside the logo for the film, but also we have a quote from original author Akira Toriyama himself. Now, the nice thing about the quote they did this time, uh, just like last time, they provided an, uh, an official English translation alongside that Japanese quote. Uh, luckily this time well it was more we're not going to actually leave stuff out yeah yeah i think is a, uh, the best way to put it yeah it seems a little more condensed last time yeah uh but it, but it's all here so uh let's take a look at this message here everyone are you familiar with broly he's an incredibly strong saiyan who only appeared in the old anime movies and i apparently at least drew the designs for him but i had practically no involvement with the anime at the time so i had totally forgotten about the story content so, about Broly, I hear these days he's very popular not only in Japan, but also overseas. Based on that, my editor suggested we have Broly appear in this next movie. I went ahead and watched the movies from back then, and I felt this could be quite interesting once I rearranged some things. I got right to work trying my hand at a story that incorporates him into the Dragon Ball Super series. While keeping in mind Broly's classic image so as not to disappoint his fans, I updated him and added a new side to his character, and I think this has resulted in a more fascinating Broly. Naturally, you'll get to see fierce combat, but also the paths of destiny that lead to an encounter between Goku, Vegeta, and Broly. It also involves the Frieza Force and the history of the Saiyans, which end up having a major connection to everything. The story content turns out to be very large-scale and dramatic. 
Here comes that almighty Saiyan Broly. I'm also including lots of other content all you fans will enjoy, so look forward to it and be patient a while longer for it all to come together. I feel like he didn't write that last sentence, or yeah. like the last paragraph. They're like, we want you to put this in. Are you okay with it? Yeah, whatever. That's fairly standard. As someone who has written quotes in press releases for other people and sent <laughs> mm-hmm. it to them and said, you said this, right? Yes, I absolutely did say that. Great. Um, yeah, that's typically how <laughs> these things work. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to pull out of there. We have a lot of questions to ask ourselves about some of this new information. Uh, so let's just leave it there for a moment. We got a couple last little tidbits to pull out of this. Then we'll move on to the larger questions here. Heath, this is going to be an IMAX. That makes sense. Battle of Gods was the first Japanese film to be screened in IMAX digital. And then Resurrection F was the first IMAX 3D presentation for a Japanese film. So it makes sense for their collaboration with IMAX to continue here. Actually, IMAX is, um, that's where we got an English language press release for Resurrection F pretty early on, wasn't it? If I remember. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So be curious to see if uh, IMAX does any additional marketing for this film as well. Uh, makes sense. They probably will. I would imagine. Because didn't we also get IMAX exclusive previews and trailers? I think I remember. so. That makes sense. Probably. Yeah. So let's turn it over to the typical Konzenshi way of doing things. Let's jump back into the history and the context here. Uh, if you're just joining Dragon Ball in 2018, uh, welcome. Uh, there's a rich history of over 30 years for you to catch up on mm-hmm. at this point. Let's talk a little bit about who this Broly dude is. His power is maximum. His power Sorry, is indeed maximum. Uh, all right, now that that's out of our system, uh, we can proceed. So, Heath, Broly is the main antagonist from the eighth Dragon Ball Z theatrical film in 1993. He came back a few times, huh? Just a few. Just a few. Now yeah. to be four. Yeah, well, not necessarily back. Again, uh, it's a new Broly. That, that is true, and we'll get into that. So Broly showed up in the eighth movie. Uh, he returned in the tenth movie, so he skipped one. Uh, we got Bojack in the meantime. And then he came back again as a clone in the eleventh Dragon Ball Z film. And I bet you if Koyama had his way, he would have had Broly back <laughs> again and again and again. Uh, but they did move on to other characters. So I threw out a name there, Tako Koyama. Uh, he was a scenario writer, a script writer for the Dragon Ball Z franchise. Uh, he was you could really say he was the the guy in charge of the films uh, back during contemporary serialization, huh? Yes. Yeah. I mean, he oversaw the series as well. He was the lead writer. But as they really started to get hot and heavy with movies where they started doing two a year, mm, yeah. he, they, he pretty much moved over to the film production side and kind of left the TV scripts to other people. So for the most part, uh, what, he wrote every Dragon Ball Z film? Yeah, his name so. is all over the place there. Yep. Uh, that, that seemed to be his creative baby, and uh, we're not going to talk about this right now, but just to, to mention it, we've talked uh, in the past about how there's kind of like Akira Toriyama, baseline manga Goku, there is general Toei animation, Son Goku, and then there's Koyama's interpretation of Goku, which gets a little more heroic and monologue and then even further beyond that, there's kind of like old school style Funimation uh, English dubbed Goku. It's like this layer of heroicism that changed the character of Goku along the way. Koyama is the person responsible for uh, that kind of characterization and writing throughout the film. So he was responsible for coming up with the character of Broly. Uh, but Koyama is not an artist. Uh, Toriyama himself came in here and, and helped really shape and form and design Broly. Uh, we've seen his designs through things like the Daisenshu and various guidebooks that have come along over the years. Uh, the designs are there, and, it, and per, the, per the norm for Toriyama, he has things that he's not particularly committal about. Um, there's the, the one comment there about, yeah, he can have a tail, he doesn't have to have a tail, whatever. Uh, mm-hmm. But then there are certain things where he's like, no, absolutely, this is how it is. Uh, things like, well, he absolutely doesn't wear the typical um, battle armor because that's from Frieza's army and they absolutely did not serve in Frieza's army. Yeah, it's funny how he actually put some thought into it, even though he's like, I'm not involved with this at all, but right. he asked me to do it. So, yeah, this is actually the first film that uh, Tadayoshi Yamamuro took over the animation supervision character mm, yeah, design role. This is where it changed, yeah. So, yeah. It was, uh, he also helped create Broly. Yeah, obviously he's know. doing the final designs that you see on screen. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, we've seen this even in Dragon Ball Super, where Toriyama provides, here are my character designs, but then Yamamoro will do, all right, this is how 
these are the proportions. These are the exact colors that you will then take and use in the in the TV series. So similar things go on with the movies and even the TV series. Uh, so that was the creation of Broly. Heath, I actually don't remember uh, where this information uh, pulled from. It's somewhere on the site. But they actually came up with titles for movies before they even came up with any plot elements or anything. And they're mm-hmm. like, all right, and, and now we got to figure out what that battle title actually means. <laughs> That's right. And movie eight's one of those titles. Where it's like a fierce, hard battle. Sure. All right, man. Was it uh, a red hot raging super fierce fight? Because <laughs> that's how everyone refers to that movie. <laughs> right. It even extends to the ending theme. Uh, yeah, it's Nessun, always Nessun Resin Cho Kessin. Is it something like that? Yeah. Uh, Nessun Resin Cho Cho Gekisen. It's always funny because even in Japan, everyone just refers to the movies by numbers. Yeah, it's by numbers or by villain. I mean, Funimation yeah. adopted the villain uh, naming title scheme up until a certain point. And it is it's really funny to look back at all the movie titles that, that used to be. And then now we're getting less and less. And now <laughs> we we're are. down to a single word. <laughs> That's right. Or a character name. <laughs> we went from Kami to Kami Battle of Gods to Fukatsu no F, Resurrection F, Broly. <laughs> yep. Broly. Oh, wonderful. So that's the creation of the character of Broly. Who, who is he? Well, he's a, another Saiyan character. We've had a few over the years. Uh, we actually got Tullus in Dragon Ball Z Movie 3, so he's not even the first new Saiyan uh, original creation in movies. Uh, we got up to three before we got one then we got another one here in eight uh he was born alongside son goku uh there in the hospital uh his father paragus was there um king vegeta was uh informed and seemingly a little frightened by the overwhelming power of broly heath correct me if i'm wrong broly was born with a battle power of ten thousand. is that accurate sure there's a website that'll tell us this if if you want it to be just don't say over a certain number. I know I people I, will I, lose it. I don't want to get this wrong. I need to go look at. Oh, isn't don't we have like combined? Yeah, we have combined list. All right. Yeah, there's a combined right. list. Broly is maybe ten thousand. Source: Dragon Ball Z Movie Eight. Burn up a red hot raging super fierce fight. I was accurate. Thank you. Well. Well, Goku was born with power level of two. Of two. So that's the comparison there. Uh, King Vegeta is a little frightened of him. Uh, as we will see, like we have Frieza getting a little scared of the signs. Even King Vegeta is a little scared of Broly in this film. Uh, his father, Paragus, goes to plea for his life. Uh, spoilers for a movie from... 25 years ago. Hey, uh, it's going to be in theaters here shortly. It is. Maybe you've never seen it. The, they try to kill Broly and Paragus and off into space. and They throw know. him out with the trash. Uh, and Paragus comes looking for revenge on Vegeta and um, Broly is under control and he sees Goku. He's and, rampaging across the galaxy. Yep, destroying stuff. Within Universe 7 specifically. Kakaroto yelling, screaming, powering up. Uh, uh, our, our red hot raging super fierce fight ensues, uh, and everyone's happy in a spaceship at the end of the film. Uh, then Broly comes back, and then Broly's clone comes back. So this is the character that we are talking about. Uh, he's a very iconic character for the Dragon Ball franchise. As early as his creation, uh, he was thrown into video games Uh at Toei Animation's insistence, really. Uh, I talked about this with Julian when we were finally diving into some of the 30th anniversary book interviews uh, when Super Butoden 2 was under uh, development as they were working with Toei to get all the characters and their animation and their moves and the colors, all that. Um, they asked for movie characters to be included. That's how we got Bojack and Zanga in there. And that's yep. how we got Broly in there as well. Uh, so Broly, his inclusions in video games dates all the way back right there. He has been there. And their sprites are all over the internet. Yeah, you've definitely and have seen. been since like the mid '90s. <laughs> you've seen all these video games rights before. Uh, they have included Broly in anything that they can, including where it's not even remotely appropriate, such as uh, Attack of the Science on Nintendo DS, where we're, we're playing the Cyan Arc. Sure, why not? Uh, he's always there. Uh, he's featured in video game intros as often as they possibly can. Wasn't he also part of that stage production that they did in Japan? One of them, that sure sounds familiar. Yeah. So, I mean, he's been 
everywhere. Poor guy. Just getting passed around. He is played by a, uh, a beloved, well-known, uh, accomplished voice actor. I mentioned him earlier, Bin Shimada. Uh, always there, still rocking those pipes. Although he's hardly ever had actual speaking lines. <laughs> no, he gets progressively <laughs> fewer character. lines <laughs> as time goes on. Uh, people don't remember that Broly actually says quite a bit in Dragon Ball Z Movie 8. That changes over time. So yes. that's who Broly is. That's how he came to be. That's who he is. He was reused a few times. Um, let's chat about what some of the other people have to say about Broly. We're going to start not back in the day. We're going to pull it forward a little bit. Uh, it's a 2003 interview. This was printed in Viz's Shonen Jump magazine uh, back when they had a print magazine. Yes, here in America, they had a print magazine for many years. So this was, I think, the third issue of that. They have an interview between Akira Toriyama and two professional inline skaters. Now, this was all <laughs> <laughs> this is all handled around the time of the launch of the magazine. They actually had Toriyama come out to New York. It was, it was a big deal. Uh, so they printed this interview in the magazine, and uh, so there's Ato and Takashi are the the two skaters. They're they're chatting with Toriyama here. Ato says, "I made a homepage called Cabin Eight, where I'm displaying my rough sketches. I'm wondering if I can get an autograph from you. Would it be possible for you to do a self portrait of yourself?" Toriyama says, "Ah, that's like the hardest request. I don't know who's translating Toriyama here, but him saying like is." particularly wonderful uh so then takashi says how about kami Senin or vegeta i like vegeta too or broly from the movies and toriyama's response was broly who was he i don't know if he was in the manga let's put this in context this is 2003 the newest thing going on right now is the kanzenban release so toriyama has only just recently reread the original manga as he's doing new artwork for it he has not heavily been involved in dragon ball for quite some time gt has been off the air for quite a few years at this point and his involvement in that was very early on toriyama's off in his own world right now rightfully so he's taking a break he's doing other stuff along the way uh, Nekomajin is going on around this time, but that's about it. It's not surprising at this point for Toriyama to not remember a movie villain. Am I being fair here, Heath? Yes, because he hardly remembered his own manga characters anyway. Now that's being a little disingenuous too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lunch, where are you thou? Uh, we're not having that conversation. He forgot who Tal Pai Pai was, which may yes, be a little that's surprising. True. That's the infamous example with Oda in uh, Color Walk 1 there. Um, but a movie character, like, I can't fault the dude for not knowing the movie character. No, especially when all he did was draw some character designs, and that was about it. Right, and we know that even he kind of stopped religiously watching the anime over time as well. He's, he's just not that super Well, cool. I know he had said that he had previously seen some of the movies right but right. that was more at the beginning and i think as the manga serialization was really going hot and heavy yeah, yeah. he pretty much stopped <laughs> yeah so because he used to get they would send him advanced copies that he would just watch in his house because he did That's not true. want to go to the movie theater mm -hmm. oh yeah, yeah yeah i specifically remember that he doesn't want to go out in public anymore this is toriyama's life at this point so mm -hmm. Let, let's just frame it 2003 doesn't necessarily remember who broly is that's fine. Let's jump ahead a few years. Uh, Heath, Dragon Box the Movies came out in 2006. Uh, we have the theatrical story Q&A from It's Dragon Book translated up on the website. We have some comments here from Tako Koyama, again, who was, uh, you could say, the true creator of Broly. Uh, and they ask him, why did Broly come back three times? They get... Look, I always say that this material, it's propaganda. It is carefully selected and written to appeal to you at the lowest common denominator level. They want to sell you more things. They are actually getting somewhat transparent here. They're going straight to the source. Dude, why is Broly in this thing three times? And Koyama says, because he laughs a lot here too, because he's the strongest, even including the TV anime. Nobody exists in the world who's stronger than Broly. I mean, even Vegeta, Prince of the Science, was trembling in fear. Ha 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 I felt that there's no way that kind of mightiest being would die in a single outing. After all, there were kids who cried at Broly's overwhelming strength when they saw Burn Up at Shueisha's preview screening. Ha 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 ha! 
Look, it says laugh, so I'm going to do the laugh. It's always difficult coming up with an enemy for Goku because I constantly have to escalate their strength. So, he ended up appearing three times. This is true of Broly as well, but Goku and company are always fighting against an unbeatable foe. Goku must win against such an enemy, so he has no choice but to defeat him when his enemy becomes overconfident and creates an opening. There's absolutely no way he'd be able to win against someone like Broly if he used more orthodox methods. Koyama's an interesting guy. I think somebody's in love. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll certainly talk about that. Uh, <laughs> so let's talk about the Dragon Ball Z films briefly here. So you mentioned uh, earlier that we got to a point when we were getting two films a year. Now, these screened as double, sometimes even triple features, kind of like um, during school breaks, vacation times. These were a chance for families and kids to just chill. Which is why they were shorter movies because they would uh they would show a sailor moon movie then dr slump then dragon ball z and so they'd all be like 45 minutes long and they would typically come out during school breaks so that all the kids could go to the theaters and see them it wasn't really until what i think with one piece really where they started doing all the big large production two hour movies and then dragon ball kind of fell into that for when sure. They rebooted it. People always talk about, oh, it's another one off Shonen movie. Uh, th- this is just how it was. This was the standard of production for this, where it would be a standalone, no established continuity. The characters ex- as they exist at that point in time. So mm-hmm. anyone can kind of just jump in and either enjoy it because they know it or become newly indoctrinated into the series. I mean, everyone knew Dragon Ball, but maybe you didn't know Ninku and you went and you saw the double feature. And you're like, oh, and this Ninku thing sounds cool. Maybe I'll go yeah. check that out when that's on TV. That, that's what these were for. I mean, they were 100 percent promotional products. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you could say that about the TV series, but I mean, these were just. Yeah, that's all they were for was to push product. <laughs> And we were just so, talking about how the the new heroes promotional anime, and my theory is they they wanted to make something just continue to keep Dragon Ball in the public consciousness for the remainder of the year. And yeah, the, these Dragon Ball Z movies were made at a time when obviously the TV series was still new, uh, airing for the first time, so there, there was no worry about it leaving the public consciousness. But it's a chance for new characters, new settings, new scenarios, new transformations. I mean, even talking about Super Butoden too, it's a chance to put new things in even the video games at that time because mm-hmm. they were already telling the same stories over and over. Uh, again, I, I referenced back to that episode I recorded with Julian about the uh, Famicom, Super Famicom era. At that point, they already the video games caught up with the manga. They had Koyama right plan to eradicate the science. They needed new material the video games in 1993 and 1994 were already out of material so the movies were a great way to expand upon the franchise and it was just the norm at the time i mean that's toei did that with all of their most popular anime series they would just hold festivals and create movies all right so we set up with these movies were koyama is bringing broly back (laughs) over and over and over uh who do we have return? We had Kula return, but that's pretty mm-hmm. much it. Everyone yep. else was original. And it, like you said, it really seems like he fell in love with his character w- without condemning a certain pop fandom populace. The way Koyama talks here is, is very childish. <sighs> and, and I say that as just like this wide eyed fascination with man, there's so many strong dudes. Isn't it awesome? And he seems so impressed that he was able to make children cry. I, I, I wonder about this dude. Not seriously, but just like 50%, yeah. I wonder about Koyama. <laughs> oh, we'll just, we'll move on to the next comment to really solidify all this. All right. So you want to jump ahead in time here. Uh, Heath, you are now going to take over the role of Takao Koyama. I, I dubbed the Oh, God, Koyama. I don't want to. <laughs> well, too bad. So Battle of Gods comes out in 2013. Koyama has not really been involved in anything that's going on. Uh, we had an original script. Uh, from a different writer, Toriyama brought in at seemingly Kazuhiko Torishima's insistence of, hey, check out what's out going on with your franchise over here. Toriyama comes in and redoes stuff. Uh, so Toriyama is the new character designer on the film, effectively, uh, and ends up rewriting effectively the entire script. So Koyama gets a chance to, uh, on the sideline, go out and check out a preview screening of Battle of Gods. Heath, what does Koyama have to say about Battle of Gods? I mean, how odd must that be for him to be like, I have to go to the movie theater to see this? <laughs> Granted, I like 
I don't want to say I don't envy his position, but it's a very, very different position for Koyama and Dragon Ball. So yes, to some degree, you expect some kind of response. All right, what was that response? This is a selection from what he had to write. For this time, Goku's opponent, designed by Toriyama Sensei, was even a god of destruction. In the world of Dragon Ball Z, that's a setting where even Broly, before the god of destruction, would face a gap like that between a Yokozuna and the very bottom of the sumo ranks. That Broly reduced to a pushover. Only from the impression I got of the character on the screen, Broly was scarier. No contest. Am I the only one who found that Broly looked overwhelmingly frightening? Or am I just biased toward my own creation? So this was a blog post that Koyama put up on his personal blog. The way he writes here, look, I don't know the guy. I unfortunately missed my chance to meet him. Uh, I was out of state during a convention. I I have massive regrets over this because I would have grilled this dude, probably gotten kicked out of the convention as a result of it. The way he's writing here, now this is much more candid than something that's going to be published in a Toei publication, and even before it seemed relatively candid. The way he wraps it up here seems to be one of those, aren't I a nice guy? Like, I'm conceding that I'm biased, but the entire approach he writes... like I know, he's like, yeah, even though this new character would beat the snot out of my character, mine looked way better. He was so much scarier. He made children cry. I mean, come on, did Toriyama do that? That Broly reduced to a pushover. Like He really yeah. feels something for his creation. To a degree. I like I get it. You created an iconic Dragon Ball character that not even Akira Toriyama would have designed. That deserves praise and respect. The way he writes here is just so at odds with everything else. Look, I'm just going to say it. At a professional level compared to everything else we've had written about the franchise, even Toriyama at his lowest of lows, which is basically talking about Dragon Ball Evolution a few years out, doesn't doesn't get down here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't I don't know what else to say about it. It's just it speaks for itself. It I think it does. All right. We're going to jump ahead to current stuff now. Uh, We're into 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018. The the, the era of Dragon Ball Super. Dragon Ball is in a a different place now. Shueisha has created uh, something entirely new that hasn't existed before that seems like it always did exist, but technically didn't on paper. It's called the Dragon Ball Room. Uh, Shueisha calls this kind of like an interdepartmental collaboration to oversee the future of the Dragon Ball franchise, uh, new creations for guiding it, guiding its success uh, onward into the future. founded that in 2016? Yep, 2016. They kind of had it secret for like half a year (laughs) before they Mm -hmm. actually announced it. Yeah. They held on to it. Uh, And then even when they kind of announced it, they didn't really describe what all they would do. Right. There was nothing really going on. We did this thing. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, it seems like they made it as they realized that Dragon Ball Super was kind of a clusterfuck. So So the head of the Dragon Ball room is a man named Akio Ioku. Uh, That name may be familiar to you if you're following along with Konzenshu right now. Uh, Ioku is actually the editor in chief of V-Jump right now as well. Uh, Kazuhiko Torishima was, um, he oversaw the monthly reboot of V-Jump and oversaw for many years until he turned back over to Weekly Shonen Jump. But Ioku is the current editor in chief of V-Jump, which is a, a monthly flagship magazine for Shueisha, and we talk about V-Jump often. But Ioku is also the head of the Dragon Ball Room, so he is he is one of the headest of head honchos overseeing Dragon Ball. Now, we got an interview, an article, uh, with Ioku about the Dragon Ball Room uh, early last year, as Dragon Ball Super was still going strong. Uh, I, I want to read a little selection from it here, and then we're going to talk about the universe survival arc. article says, One particularly large difference between Japan and overseas is the quote-unquote incredible popularity of the movie original character Broly, who appeared as an enemy in three films, one of which featured a clone of him. Ioku says here, he's got bulging muscles and gives Goku a tough fight, so the Super Saiyan version Broly is popular. They have cited Broly, and I say they, just Japanese branch of Dragon Ball's existence as a whole here. They have cited the popularity of Broly multiple times. Uh, I think this was the key time that we can point back to and say, ah, 
This is where they did it. They have seen Broly's popularity. And that's not to say he's not popular in Japan. I, I think they're not telling the full story there. Broly is certainly popular in Japan. Uh, he's been, just like in um, America, in, in the Western world, he's been an ironic popular figure, subject of many memes in Japan, but he's also genuinely popular. Broly is the same everywhere. Uh, but they definitely harp on the international popularity of the character there. Well, in a... Uh a later interview, which we may talk about, hmm. he did state that it was in the spring of 2017 that they first approached Toriyama with multiple movie ideas. Right. And so that's about the same time as when this interview came out. So mm. I right, think right. you can kind of put two and two together. <laughs> yeah. Be very curious to, uh, we may never know what some of those other ideas were that are on the table. Were some of them <sighs> completely original stories uh, or were they these completely transparent pandering kinds of stories. Uh, don't know that we'll ever know. So let's talk about the universe survival arc. We know that in Dragon Ball Super, uh, the original character created for Universe 6 uh, Beyond Kaba uh, was Kale. That was going to be the female character they brought in. Uh, and they brought to Toriyama and said, you know, basically, we want to reinvent Broly for this. And Toriyama did character designs there. But Toriyama wasn't satisfied with that. And he created Caulifla separate from Kale and introduce them there. And uh, I know I talked about this in the Universe Survival arc where Caulifla definitely feels like the Toriyama character. Uh, her writing style, her delivery, her motivations are Toriyama through and through. And Kale just feels like, yeah, they, they very transparently uh, recreated Broly for this. Um, not just the overall design, but there were specific uh, motions, movements, camera framings, bits of dialogue that were lifted wholesale from movie mm -hmm. eight in particular. Uh, it was, it was obvious, but it was, this is what we're doing. And the entire, like it, it was an open nudge, nudge, nod to fans. It, it just, it was what it was. I remember Twitter the night when that episode first aired <laughs> and it was, oh man, it just blew up. Oh, with her, uh, berserker transformation. Yes. Thing. Well, especially and, here in North America. I remember even earlier than that, uh, they were being very coy with how they rolled out these characters. We didn't know if Kale and Cauliflaw were one in the same because the first things we saw were like the in-between, uh, mm -hmm. Kale transformation, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Where she still had control. But she had like longer hair up top and it was getting a little yep. green. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, their role of those characters, I, I kind of want to say it was a little brilliant because you didn't know what was going on. We were all uh, taken aback a little bit. We're, what was that? Here comes new Cyan. It's like, oh, it's this. Is, does this character look like that character? Not really. I don't know. What are they doing here? Um, so, so good on them. So that was what they did in Dragon Ball Super is they reinvented Broly for the modern era as a completely new character, acknowledging the history of Broly, but making a new character. And that's what's so strange about this now is they've brought back the actual Broly. So theoretically, as this film is entitled as a Dragon Ball Super film, um, it, it would you expect to exist in the same continuity as the Dragon Ball Super TV series at the very least. So perhaps Kale and Broly could exist side by side. Heath, let's take this back to Toriyama's comments for the film. Uh, he talks about a, a lot of interesting stuff here. Uh, he is going back to the character of Broly, but he's reinventing him in a way. It seems like he's taking these base elements, the, the raw look of the character, uh, obviously the transformation we see at the bottom of the poster there. He's going to do something new with Broly though. Yes. That's what he said. <laughs> Here's the question for us. This isn't new for Toriyama. We've told the stories many times about the Cell arc and how we had involvement from prior editor and current editor uh, suggestions shaping the course of the Cell arc, uh, changing what Toriyama was doing. Think about Battle of Gods in particular. Uh, Toriyama was not involved in the creation of Battle of Gods initially. Uh, Yusuke Watanabe had written an original script. Yamamuro had designed a beefier Super Saiyan god with a cape and a, and a lizard form of Beerus who was going to infect the Saiyans. Uh, this stuff was completely changed by Toriyama. He took folks' original creations and made a new work. He took Bardock and made a new version of Bardock in the Dragon Ball Minus chapter of Jocko the Galactic Patrolman. Toriyama is not afraid to take other folks' creations and do something new with them. Do you think it's possible for him to do that with Broly? I think that is much more of a question here than it ever has been with anything else. 
Do you think he can do it? I think he can do it. It's just more than any other character, you know, except maybe Bardock. Broly is just so, um, I don't even know how you want to put it, tied with the franchise yeah. as he is. I mean, he's a character that's been established for a long time. He has his own backstory. Um, we've met his father. We know who he is, where he's from, what he's been through. Yeah, pe- past motivations, current motivations, yeah. goals. Yep. And then all of a sudden now, you know, we don't know at this point exactly how much of that is going to change. Mm. But it's just really odd to take a, a pre-existing character with almost, I would say, a full, complete backstory yeah. and possibly completely redo it just so you can reintroduce the character under the same name with the same look. And it's just, I've never felt more um, kind of apathetic about him reusing a character than at this point. Just because of that, because he is so widely known, like internationally. Yeah. And even if you're not, say, someone that's super familiar with the series, you've most seen people Broly. know who Broly is. Right. I mean, he's on t shirts, he's memes, he's uh, people that don't even follow the series use him in memes because they think it's funny because they use him as a caricature of the entire franchise. Yep. yep. So that's why I find it really weird. I mean, what what are your thoughts on some of that? Because I know what your thoughts were on Bardock. I was going to say, that's the closest we've had. And we've talked a bit about the Dragon Ball Minus bonus chapter where it's it's barely a story. It doesn't have time to get in there. It, mm-hmm. it seems like it retells Bardock's story. Think about all the conversations that came after that. Does he have psychic powers? D- does he end up no challenging Frieza that exact same way in the end because what we saw in the TV series and the TV series is based on on the manga uh, you you get those canon continuity discussions and that's even ignoring Dragon Ball Online which which gives mm-hmm. him an entirely different story and uh, Xenoverse pulls from that as well I mean Bardock is the character who's had the most done and changed and expanded about him that doesn't even get into episode of Bardock because this new movie is not just going to be a bonus chapter thrown at the end of a manga as clearly it was a toss away let's just do a bonus for the collected edition this this is a major production that's going to get international you know release and funding that kind of thing that changes broly more than episode of bardock and dragon ball minus change bardock and i'm a little hesitant about that as well because as much as i'm interested in toriyama's spin on things Part of me is also like, oh, don't just change it because you can. Like, yeah, we we've enjoyed, not enjoyed. Like that is the story. That's the established story. That's what we've gone with for for so long. Like that's the character. Why do you feel comfortable in doing that? At the same time, who am I to tell Akira Toriyama what to do here? It's just so odd now that we're going to have two different versions of a single character within somewhat of the same continuity. Yeah. Like, it's just, it's really weird. I Part of me almost is, is thinking I would be more okay with it if he, say, renamed the character and made some slight other modifications. You know, so it was somewhat a different person. He's completely taking that character and making it his own. Whereas in this case, he's taking this character as is and just changing it, but keeping him. That's the thing that's throwing me off because they literally yeah. just did that with Kale. Like that was the point of that character. I, I don't think that leaves an opening to explore Broly now. Like you, you have explored the alternate Broly. And it was well, Kale. especially when when he talks about in his comment about really exploring the the backstory and the the legacy and how it ties in with the science of, of and all the films. Movie eight feels like the most fleshed out, realized world. When it was one of the longer films, right? <laughs> it and thirteen, yeah. Yeah, I guess to go back to your original question, yes, I think Toriyama can do a good job. I'm just so hung up on the other aspects of it. Yeah. That yeah. It's just bothersome. I mean, I'm sure I will enjoy it and it's a new thing and I'll go see it. But it's just the whole, I guess my biggest qualm is they talk about in all these interviews they've done, um, Iyoku's talked about it. You know, he wanted to reach out to new fans. That was his goal. And then 
we're doing all these things like in Dragon Ball Super with Kale and Califla and now we're doing Broly again. And it's like, are you reaching for new people? Are you but it seems so nostalgic at the same time. Right. And then you went through all this trouble of refreshing all the character designs, getting um right, new people to right. come in. You made a huge deal out of it. And then all of a sudden you're just like, hey, we're going to do Broly. Here you guys go. And it's like you had this massive opportunity to create something brand new, fresh, that had nothing to do with nostalgia. It would You could make all new characters, a new setting. We had the setup of Toriyama's interview, um, or was it Q&A, whichever, about the Saiyan lore mm. and backstory. And yeah. we were all like, oh, yes, this is where he's going. This is going to be great. And I don't know. It's like there were, it just seems like there were all these opportunities and then they just decided, let's go with something safe that we know everyone will like. And I guess hope it doesn't backfire. I think you're explaining it. It does seem at odds with everything they've told us and have shown off so far, which is new, 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 but Broly. <laughs> yeah. It, but it, it just seems to be not, not to go off, you know, derail this a little bit, but it just seems to be this trend that they've been doing for a long time now. I mean, if you think back to Battle of Gods, they introduced this notion of multiple universes and all the possibilities that you could even dream of that that could unlock. Um, you know, everyone was talking multiverses and then we got Dragon Ball Super and the tournament was announced. It was like, oh my gosh, just think of what we could get out of this. And all you had were characters fighting in a stadium with no backstories. And before that, you revive Frieza after you just unlocked all of these universes so you didn't even go with anything new on that one and then now we have this movie coming out and it's here's the same old broly only revamped a little bit and it's just like they seem to almost want to get in their way of we're gonna <laughs> tease you with yeah, all these yeah. new possibilities and you guys are gonna go crazy for all this stuff and it's gonna be great and then we're gonna just do this easy thing it does seem like they get cold feet along the way here's what encourages me a little bit. So we know that the future Trunks arc of Dragon Ball Super was an editorial idea brought to Toriyama, mm -hmm. who then outlined that story. The future Trunks arc of Dragon Ball Super was my favorite part of Dragon Ball Super. It seems like it was plenty of folks' favorite part of Dragon yeah. Ball Super. That's an example of Mr. Toriyama, here's an idea with some existing characters that have been introduced and, and we're done with them. Let's bring them back and tell a new story with them. And I ended up liking it there, and it really... Well, especially when they've already promoted this as taking place pretty much immediately following the tournament. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a perfect lead-in right there. <laughs> it just felt to me like Toriyama was more involved in the future Trunks arc of Super than he was mm -hmm. at any other point in Dragon Ball Super. And so that's, again, that's what encourages me a little bit here, where... Yes, Toriyama's writing the entire script for the film as he did in Resurrection F, which I did not like as much as Battle of Gods, but Resurrection F was his idea from the start. This movie is not his idea from the start, like Battle of Gods was not his idea from the start. So there are elements about the entire production that I'm very interested in and I think are up my alley. At the same mm -hmm. time, yeah, back to your points about it seems like they're getting cool feet. It seems like they're getting in the way of producing things. I don't actually super dislike Broly. I, you said earlier, apathetic. I'm, I'm very much apathetic toward Broly. I think movie eight's fine. I mean, I have nothing wrong with him as a character. I am just tired of him. Well, yeah, <laughs> I guess, and, and that's you and I who who look at and cover everything Dragon Ball. I mean, we've had Super Saiyan four broly monkeys gods shoved down our throats yeah. <laughs> over and over like we see this character all the time um but i think back to movie eight there was a lot i liked about that film a lot i liked about that story uh i i have to say that m1522 is uh the greatest piece of dragon ball background music in the history of the franchise amen to that <laughs> I 
I don't know how much of that I'm going to get in this film. But again, it, it's so early. Like, I don't even know how we can have that conversation about, oh, I'm excited about this. I'm not excited about this. We yeah, only have sure. the baseline information. We know we're going to get some new characters in the film as well. And it seems like they got blasters and motivations. We hear that Toriyama is changing some things up about Broly and his story. What are some things, if he's going to change things, what elements do you want to see? switched up about Broly. Well, what I really like, at least from the onset, is where they already brought in the aspect of we're going to explore the science as a race. Mm. Kind of in in general, kind of get a little more backstory, a little bit more lore. I always kind of like the history stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I am kind of happy from that respect that they're going to do that. And I also, one aspect I would like to change, while he does have dialogue in movie eight, it's not like the most well-written dialogue. I, I would not read that as a sonnet, <laughs> you know? That's Koyama Takao for you. But I think with Toriyama at the helm providing the script, I feel like he can actually develop the character just a little bit more than we had. Not that he was terrible to begin with as far as his type of personality and who he is. But I feel like the writing could be a little better. Um, and he could provide some of his own narrative. And I think that would be helpful. What I think Toriyama is good at is writing a sympathetic character, even when they're a villain. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you're sympathetic toward Broly at the beginning of movie eight. But as soon as he's just wild destroying civilizations you kind of lose any sympathy for well and i for him. and i think toriyama is going to be really good at making that difference much more drastic I think much so. more i'm gonna make you fall in love with him for the first you know whatever half an hour of the movie mm. and then all of a sudden you are just gonna hate this guy and it's gonna be that weird feeling of wait but i like him yeah yeah now I don't, and I think that could work very well. Um, be very beneficial to some of the backstory that they're going to hopefully try to pull in. What backstory elements do you want to see? I mean, I I, I really like I the idea know. of King Vegeta being scared of him because that just shows how petty he is, even beneath Frieza being scared of everyone. I, like I think that was good stuff there, I, and we might get that because Paragus is probably going to be in the movie. Um, more than likely the way it looks, he will be. So uh, that also raises the question, you know, is it going to be a rehash or is his involvement completely redone? Do we get like the, um, the, the same opening half hour of the film and then like it clearly becomes a Dragon Ball Super film after that? Well, point? in the recent interview that Yoku did, he mentions that Toriyama himself designed um, the planet. That they'll be on. Mm, right, right. So we know they're going to be on a different planet at some point. Mm. Um, and he also talks about some new machinery and mechanical items. That's right. I forgot about that part. Mecha. Yeah. So it's like, okay, where's this going? Are we going to have little slave aliens? That's, I don't know. That's exciting <laughs> to me. Toriyama and mecha designs. I mean, that is pure oh, yeah. blissful Toriyama artistry like that's what i'm looking for so if they're talking that about and that goku riding on a dinosaur there we go it's all i need <laughs> uh what other stuff about broly in the movie that toriyama mentions here it also involves the frieza force um and they end up having a major connection to everything turns out to be large scale and dramatic i, yeah. I, I feel like toriyama has said these things before and i didn't necessarily buy it in the end I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm hoping he follows through on that here i think it could work out well because it I mean, it sets up for it a lot in movie eight originally, Yeah, where I could totally see how you could fit Freeze in there, especially because you have King Vegeta. Um, yeah. Is it going to be kind of a, was King Vegeta really scared of him or was Frieza and Frieza made him get rid of it? You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, who knows? So I, I think there's a lot they could do with it. It's a matter of what are they going to do with it. I think that's the part that I guess is the most frightening because we're kind of in limbo on that. But it's also kind of exciting because what is Toriyama really thinking of? Because for as long as we've been doing this and as many times as we, as we get together and have these discussions of, oh my, oh, what should we anticipate? You know, are the Makayo coming now? <laughs> or is this we finally happening? stopped having that conversation. <laughs> yep. You know, every time, and we think we know what Toriyama is going to do, and he just puts it on a tee and hits it out of the park and just 
no one saw that coming. I think the only real thing for me was kind of Resurrection F was really the first one where it was just kind of like, this is what it's going to be. This is what it was. Mm. That's what I saw. Yeah. Um, I don't think this is going to be that. I think this will be a little, because it is, you know, we're bringing this character back. It's essentially the same movie, but we're just going to tweak a couple things. I think there will be some stuff in there that Toriyama is just going to surprise people and go, oh, I never thought of that. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be that because we also have too many cooks in the kitchen here. Like this is a yeah. this is a new production under the Dragon Ball room now, uh, looking at the future of the franchise. At the same time, you know, we continue to wonder, can anyone say no to Toriyama? Can anyone tell him to do something different? And I, I wonder if we're, we're at that point now. Maybe, maybe they can. Well, Ioku kind of jokes about it a little bit of... You know, they want to keep him happy because as soon as he says, no, I'm not going to do it anymore, mm. that it may just end. <laughs> yeah, so, it, it's not. I mean, you, you'd you certainly lose whatever that magical spark is, but then it loses that legitimacy as well. Yeah. And, and he reiterates over and over that um, not only was his goal to reach out to new fans and try to do that. I'm talking about Ioku mm-hmm. in his interview. He also wants Toriyama to be involved. And I think a lot of that goes back to Oda being involved with One Piece movies Mm. so much. I think they really saw that formula and how much, let's just say, better written (laughs) (laughs) overall the One Piece movies became, uh, much less generic. And we've definitely seen that in Dragon Ball. Yeah. So I guess as far as excitement level, if you want to get on that, I'm, I'm not overly excited. But as much as I've ranted earlier... I'm I'm not as mad, I guess would be a good way. To, like, I'm not, man, I'm not going to go see this thing. This is going to be terrible, if that makes sense. I'm just impartial at the moment because I just want to see where this goes. I think it's going to be very interesting to follow. I am just more curious than anything else. I know, like, that's my strongest, I don't know if that's an emotion. It's certainly a feeling is, man, all right, if we're going to do a Dragon Ball Super film with Broly, this is the way to do it. And all right, show me what you got. Like I'm ready for them to put up or shut up at this point, I guess. Yeah. Uh, And and that doesn't mean, oh, Vegito X is dropping Dragon Ball if this movie doesn't succeed at meeting his expectations. It just means, all right, guys, if you're going to do this, if you're going to say you're entering a brave new world for the franchise, but you're also going to do literally the safest thing you could possibly do. All right. You you do have to prove yourself here. That's for sure. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think... They have set the bar, so let's see if they can get there. Can you imagine, like, going back in the past and telling yourself, and when Battle of Gods is coming out, you're like, guess what? In two more movies, Broly's coming back. (laughs) I mean, you you almost want to always kind of accept that that fate, right? (laughs) It's like, Mm -hmm. sure, yeah, that makes sense, they'll do that. And I believe it more now, mostly because of the Kale that's experiment that's the thing that's still tripping me up so much is they experiments are great work like they've already done this experiment they did it did they decide that wasn't what they wanted to do it didn't generate the interest to, i don't know what, what what would you think if like kula came back well they're doing that in heroes so true Ooh, and he gets golden he does kula i mean you want to talk about obvious and safe i mean there you go <laughs> there. golden kula in his fifth form wasn't there something with Koyama and his son, Makoto Koyama? They were doing some kind of... Didn't they have a separate business? Uh, They ran their own studio that would write scripts for various productions. Yes. and Did um, that close? Am I remembering that right? Yes. Um, So his son was involved as a script writer for Dragon Ball Super. Didn't he do episode of Bardock? Yes, he did. He wrote and it. And then it went... He was involved with Super up through... Like early gosh yeah it was early on and it was right up towards the end of the resurrection f i was gonna say story arc. i don't know if he even made it that far but maybe he did yeah or the beginning of it and then all of a sudden he just stopped being credited mm-hmm. altogether uh it turns out their shop their studio closed i don't know if they went bankrupt or what happened just wasn't but, working out for him yep, yeah it just uh and as far as i know neither of them have really been doing much in the anime business. Yeah, but I haven't seen I haven't ones. really been tracking them either, so they very well could be. So here's the question. Let's wrap it up with Takao Koyama. 
Uh, we, we saw what he had to say about Battle of Gods in 2013. His character is coming back under the authorial control of Akira Toriyama. I would really love for him to write a blog post. I want to know what is going on in that man's head the last week. I, I'm dying to know. I think he wants royalties. Are, are they doing anything with him? Will he get... He's got to get uh, some kind of credit or at least a special thanks in the film, right? Possibly. I mean, it's it's one of those weird things because in all the theatrical films, it's just Toriyama is credited where everything is based on his manga. The original work. So do you, yep. do you credit the guy that created a character based on an author who is now taking that character and doing his own thing with it? Yeah. Like, it's just weird, cyclical. I don't know if you credit him or you mention him at all, which I don't know if that's a good thing. Mr. Koyama, wherever you are, please start writing. Just, just do it. We'll find yep. it. We'll read it. We'll translate it. If you want to email it to us, yeah, we will we'll take it directly. Translate. You want to come on the podcast? I mean, sh- Julian, talk yeah. to you. That'd be great. Um, Heath, let's bring this to a close. We've been chatting for over an hour about something we know uh, very little about. Hey, um, at the beginning, you said we got a load of information. We did have so. a lot to cover. Uh, we did the history. We gave it the context. We talked about the news. We talked about the announcements. We gave you our thoughts. I, I think we accomplished our job here at Konzenshu, the podcast. Uh, Heath, how are things going on the website known as Konzenshu.com? Things are going well. Somewhat slow, but progressing in certain areas. We are currently working on our movie page, which will hopefully go up oh, shortly. For this film, Yes. Yes. Still need to get caught up on super episodes. A lot of wiki work has been occurring, which has been very nice to watch. So look forward to that. And then we have a revamp of an older section, which I'm still kind of keeping a surprise. I mean, I think we talked a little bit about it at some point. It's Did we? Some of the stuff okay. coming there. but Well, I don't know. Like, I listen to this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, I'm like 99.8% done with the family names page. It's coming. Yeah. There's a lot of cool stuff coming to the website. Oh, we we revamped the translation archive. We talked about that. I know you have mentioned that previously on the podcast, but I like to pimp that because I am very, very proud of it. Yeah, I think it came together very well. Yeah, Can, can you do it from my press archive now? Um, Maybe. <laughs> you, get, you get the old JavaScript right now. <laughs> I do. So... <laughs> I um actually threw myself back into that a little bit this morning, actually. Uh, I discovered an entire run of video game magazines uh, from the UK that I didn't know about that started talking about Dragon Ball as early as 1992. So that's wonderful. So I'll... Uh, oh, that would explain your tweet. Chatting with uh, different people today and got... Yep, I saw you reaching out, making some new friends. Well, new friends, old friends. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Look forward to that. I uh, wish I could quit and drop everything else I'm doing in my life and work on this all the time. Uh, I know. Be a wonderful I thing. know. www.kanznsagu.com. That is consentshu.com. Uh, this was the latest episode of our podcast. Sorry, it's a little bit later in the week than usual, but uh, clearly it was for a reason. That makes sense. So uh, we'll join you next time. Uh, maybe that prediction is checking. I would like to wrap that up before the end of July. And Jeff and I are... Forget that. It's going to be more Broly news. Um, I don't think we'll dedicate an entire episode about it until the film itself. Uh, and actually, Aww. speaking of dedicating entire episodes, I, I've seen some people ask, so are you going to individually review the Super Dragon Ball Heroes promotional anime each time? Um, what we've done in the past is like when Dragon Ball Kai started, we reviewed the first episode or two. Uh, when Dragon Ball Super we reviewed the first episode or two. And then after that, we, we like to do full arcs. You know, when it, something first debuts, I think it makes sense to approach it there. But uh, I stick by my one wanting to cover things uh, as arcs at the same time when the thing's only eight minutes long you can kind of cover everything you want so i don't know i'm i'm very undecided about what to do with uh that actually i guess by the time we chat next that next episode will be out so we'll figure out what we're doing within the next week well isn't the expectation that it's only going to be like a dozen episodes or so. That's what we're thinking. Like that's a speculation. Right. I don't know. You're, you're all going to find out uh, as soon as I find out, which is probably, there you go. probably next week. Uh, so that's the website. Those are the thoughts. Those are the website contents and podcast topics. And uh, I think I started getting there. Jeff and I are scheduling next GT episode. So uh, get ready for those next four episodes of that. Uh, I have been Mike Vichito EX. This is Heath Kujio, sir, why don't you bring the episode 
to a close. Thanks for joining us, everybody. It was great to be back. Except I had to hang out with that guy. See you next time. make sure i have all the other channels muted on the mixer okay what i'm gonna do is record um in stereo but i'm just gonna mute one side and then send you that but keep the waveform side how about that yeah that's fine okay you can recover from that right yeah yeah you you sound Mm -hmm. like you know what you're doing yep Ooh, what does this delete key do All right. Show? I suppose I'm recording. All right. Blah, 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 blah. This is Konzenshu, the podcast, episode 449 for the week of July 9th, 2018. Is this where I make the Broly monster? Hold on. No, no. It wasn't the 9th. It was the 8th. Wait, what? Who? No, today's the 10th. I know. I got to change it. 8th. Blah, blah, blah. (laughs) So uh, the article says, we've seen Toriyama revive others' creations before, namely Bardock. Now remember, this is early last year that they're talking about this. And revive his own creations before, namely Frieza. No, wait, I'm reading questions for us. Yes, you are. <laughs> I was. How long were you going to wait? I was going to let you keep going. <laughs>